And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. It's been described as the public health failure of the century, as the global death toll from the COVID-19 pandemic tops 34,000, with 723,000 confirmed cases. The United States continues to lead in coronavirus cases, with over 143,000 known infections, though the true number is certain to be much higher because of the extreme lack of testing. The U.S. is now reporting nearly 2,600 deaths after receiving widespread condemnation for downplaying the threat of the virus. On Sunday, President Trump reversed course on lifting social distancing advisories by Easter and extended the government guidelines through the end of April. This comes after he signed the record-breaking $2 trillion coronavirus bill into law Friday that's been condemned by critics for including corporate slush funds, and a record 3.3 million Americans have filed for unemployment. On Friday, the head of the International Federation of Red Cross warned social unrest could erupt among people who live in poverty and now lack resources of income and the COVID-19 crisis. We have a lot of people who is living uh, uh, very marginalized. Let me use a word in the in the black in the so-called of the black hole of the society, no, with the daily jobs or other uh, uh, way to live. And uh, in few, in few, and um, in, in, in the most difficult neighbors of the biggest city, I'm, I, I am afraid that, that in few weeks we will have social problems. This is a social bomb that can explode in every moment because they don't have any way to, to, to have an income or to find an income. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I am Amy Goodman. The global death toll from the COVID-19 pandemic, nearing 35,000, and the confirmed cases nearing three-quarters of a million around the world. We're joined now by two Yale professors who co-authored a piece for the Boston Review headlined Alone Against the Virus, in which they argue decades of neoliberal austerity will make it harder to fight the coronavirus pandemic. They write, at every step, a rapaciously profit-driven health care system and an austerity-ravaged state will make this virus harder to manage. Inequality is itself associated with poorer health outcomes, including lower life expectancies across nations. The coronavirus is about to illustrate that epidemics are great levelers. They can collapse social classes, even if, as with all forms of collapse, the people at the bottom get the worst of it. They go on to write, the question today is whether we can learn something from coronavirus that might not only help us mitigate the harm of this pandemic, but build a new infrastructure of care that allows us to better protect the most vulnerable and us all. With us now to discuss their article and their argument is Greg Gonsalves, assistant professor of epidemiology of microbial diseases at Yale School of Public Health, co-director of the Global Health Justice Partnership, and Amy Kepchinski, professor of law at Yale Law School, co-founder of the Law and Political Economy blog, co-director of the Global Health Justice Partnership. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! If you can talk about how this pandemic has really applied a microscope to health injustice, not only in this country, but in the world. Amy Kapczynski, why don't you begin? Thanks so much. Um, so there are many ways in which the coronavirus pandemic is really revealing the kind of inner logic of our system, right? And so one piece of it is think about how our healthcare system is structured, right? So, you know, the, the fact that people uh, faced the question of whether they could afford testing or whether they can afford to go in and get treatment, uh, for example, in, you know, maybe a logical place to go would be to your doctor, but people don't have doctors that they can go to, right? All of those kinds of features of our profit-driven healthcare system, along with the underfunding of the infrastructure that we need to respond to this. For example, do we have enough hospital beds? Uh, do we have the, the kind of resources given to our public health um, experts that can really allow them to respond? Uh, all of those kinds of things are going to make this pandemic 
far worse than it needed to be. Um, another really important piece of this is our carceral state. Right? The United States is extraordinarily extreme in the degree to which we put people in prison, and we use kind of carceral punitive measures to address questions of migration. This epidemic is going to spread like wildfire in prisons. We know that prisons are drivers of epidemics, and uh, we know that all of those who are being held in immigration detention are at really grave risk. And those kinds of things, the fact that we have approached uh, it, you know, the other people in our society with this kind of punitive carceral approach, um, and it's going to mean that the epidemic is going to be extraordinarily hard to control in those places. And because we're all connected, it becomes harder to control elsewhere. Greg Gonsalves, if you can talk about the failure of the response, the astounding fact that President Trump keeps boasting that he applied a very early travel ban, and yet even with this early travel ban, did not push for the access to tests, which are perhaps the number one public health measure to prevent the spread, and also the protective gear to the heroes and heroines of the United States, um, the medical professionals all over this country who are the hardest hit right now. Sure. So, as you mentioned, this is the public health failure, not this century, but probably the past hundred years, back to the 1918 great influenza epidemic that swept across the globe. Um, we knew in December that this was going to be uh, uh, a global pandemic. We, we, it was a coronavirus like SARS, which swept over the world, and we had three months to prepare. Um, there were reports internally uh, circulating in D.C., uh, let's say, even if, let's say early January, to give us a little bit of more breathing room for the public health response. But the government sat on its hands. First, it said, we're not going to use the WHO World Health Organization test. We're going to make our own. And of course, it ran into problems in, in the implementation of that test and had to start from scratch. So we got three months into the, the pandemic with no real um, public health response from our national governments. Um, then we've had this sort of contradictory set of um, pronouncements from the White House. The president underplays the seriousness of the epidemic, while um, scientists like Dr. Anthony Fauci at the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, you know, says we could see 200,000 deaths in this country. So we've had sort of a collapse of leadership from the CDC all the way up to the White House, in which we were caught, frankly, with our pants down uh, uh, for a pandemic that, that was obviously sleeping the world uh, as early as January we could have, we could have anticipated this and acted. So now, as we move forward, um, uh, Professor Gonsalves, from an epidemiological perspective, how do the neoliberal policies of the United States—and define that term, neoliberal—the um, kind of private health care system we have, how does it contribute to, accelerate the pandemic in this country? Well, you know, I'd let Amy— uh, define neoliberalism, but I think what we see here is that even in the wake of the Affordable Care Act, we still have millions of people um, uninsured in this country, of people underinsured, as Amy also suggested. We have uh, a whole class of people are outside of our circle of care, undocumented immigrants, prisoners, uh, uh, the homeless. And in order to sort of contain this epidemic, we need to know um, through testing where it is and to what extent, but we also have to be able to get people into care to be treated and, and taken care of, to be able to give them the resources they need to do social distancing. Social distancing is our main public health um, uh, tool against this virus. And unlike other countries in Europe, such as Denmark, which is uh, providing you know, 80 percent of, of salary support to, to people in order to let them be able to stay home. Um, and. Uh, a whole set of other social services we don't give in this country to our, to our populace, um, we're going to make it very, very difficult for people to uh, prevent the disease from spreading in their communities. And if this is what neoliberalism is, dog eat dog, every man and woman for himself, then maybe that's a good definition for what it is. And it's not, uh, it's hazardous to your health. Um, Professor Gonsalves, um, you go back with um, Dr. Fauci, way back, uh, to the aid, the years of massive AIDS activism. Um, uh, he was the leading figure um, during the Reagan years around AIDS. Can you talk about your relationship with him and his approach to this pandemic? Trace the trajectory from AIDS to what we're seeing now. Well, Dr. Fauci, yes, is 
seen the AIDS epidemic. He's seen Ebola. He's seen H1N1, um, SARS. He's been on the front line of all these epidemics. And, uh, you know, early relationships with him were contentious, you know, protested against him, um, locked horns with him many times in the uh, late 80s, early 90s. You were but part of I, ACT UP. I was part of ACT UP. But what's clear o over the past decade or more is that he's turned out to be a very uh, trustworthy, science-based, evidence-based um, uh, figure for helping the United States understand how to respond to infectious disease, such as during the Ebola crisis when he hugged uh, a nurse who had been uh, treated for Ebola at the National Institute of Health. He's been the one person on the podium at the White House who has been able to sort of speak truth to power and say w what the facts are rather than what the spin is coming out of the vice president, uh, the president, uh, Ambassador Burks, uh, Surgeon General Adams, and the rest. Um, Amy Kapczynski, so I'm going to leave it to you to define uh, these neoliberal policies that you have said have worsened and um, this pandemic and the effect of it in the United States. Um, and to lay out what our system is today, now insurance companies that say they will not only not charge for testing but not charge for treatment are called heroes in a private system, but afterwards will— um, immediately increase uh, people's insurance um, costs. What is a new deal for public health? But begin on the issue of neoliberal policies. Sure. So neoliberalism is commonly defined by scholars as a kind of political movement that, in fact, sought to um, change our the relationship between effectively kind of the market and democracy. So um, people often think of it as coming to prominence in the 1980s and the 1990s. Um, think of the, the Reagan and Thatcher programs and the Washington Consensus as key pillars of neoliberal policy approaches. So they demand, for example, deregulation, the starving of the state, um, the expansion of the profit motive to more and more parts of society, and um, the, the organization of more and more parts of society according to market logic, right? So, so deregulation, privatization, and the priority given to markets over society and over people. So uh, with that sort of in mind, I think it's pretty clear to see how we have built not only a healthcare system, but also a system um, of work for example, right, where there's no sick pay for so many millions of Americans, they can't stay home when they're sick. That's driven by a profit logic, right? That's driven by an extractive idea about how business should relate to human beings. And it's one that undermines the health of all of us, right? Because if people, as everyone's become really aware of uh, at this moment, if people can't stay home when they're sick, then none of us can be protected uh, from things like the coronavirus, right, and and many things beyond that. So, so that kind of profit logic, um, the same same sort of logic that starved the state, right? That has, you know, one of the things we should talk about in our piece is the way that that public health has been underfunded, right? and the way that um, you know Donald Trump is like the apotheosis of this, right? He says at some point in one of these early press conferences that he didn't want a lot of people sitting around uh, preparing for epidemics because you know that was kind of wasted overhead. Right. I mean, that kind of logic is what leaves us unprepared to deal with these deep structural vulnerabilities and, and to deal with crisis. And that's really where we're at. We don't have the resources to hand. We don't have the institutions that we need to get care and, and money to people quickly. And, and we don't have ways to support people to do what our society needs us all to do right now, which is to stay home uh, and take care of one another by staying home and, and, and engaging in social distancing. So what does a new system look like? Well, one of the, the key pillars, I think, of a new deal for public health, uh, as Greg and I see it, is, of course, something like Medicare for all, right? so that we need people to be able to access care in this country without concern that they're going to go bankrupt, right? which is what so many people face today. And we need to extend the circle of care to everyone so that we're all protected and so that we can all then be connected in this circle of care. So beyond that, of course, there are things like sick pay and rights for workers. You know, I think you're going to see that places that give workers rights are going to deal better and they're going to contribute more to our public and places that treat them as disposable. So we need more power for workers. We need more sick pay. We need an expansion of the welfare state to keep people in a position where they can 
they, they can do the, the not just the productive work of our society, but the reproductive work, right? The caring for one another, which is what we're all doing right now, right? Staying home, caring for one another. And that just doesn't count in most measures of the economy, right? Staying home doesn't count. Staying home is not productive in the way that people ordinarily think about the economy. And the system of kind of neoliberal economics that we've been given is one that systematically exploits the kind of care that we give for one another that's unpaid. And it doesn't, uh, doesn't provide us with the resources that we need to kind of reproduce ourselves as a society. So, so we need those resources. We also need to roll back the carceral state, right? That is spending extraordinary sums and putting people in extraordinary grave danger, even in ordinary times, right? And and providing us with, with, with none of the things that, that we really need to be able to address the underlying causes of things like crime in our society. So, so all of those pieces together, um, along with a recognition that, in fact, the economy is something that we build. We build it together. And we need to build an economy that is, is worthy of the society that we want to live in, uh, rather than one that treats people as, as disposable and that kind of exploits um, our, our planet and also uh, our forms of care in the way that this one does today. And finally, Greg Gonsalves, where does Medicare for All fit into this picture? Um, how do you see it saving the lives of not only the most vulnerable, but of everyone? So it, it's interesting. There's a piece in The Times today by Emmanuel Saez and uh, Gabriel Zuckman from Berkeley that talk about COVID care for all. Um, and I think we're talking. I think the the neologism is 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 interesting because this is what has brought us to this brink. The failure of care in the United States, um, which is uh, not recapitulated anywhere else in the in the industrialized world, has led us to a point where. Um, depends on who you are, whether you're going to get sick or whether you're going to get well, whether you're going to get infected with coronavirus or you're not going to get infected with the coronavirus. So unless we take care of each other um, from coast to coast, from north to south, east to west, um, we're going to be vulnerable uh, as the—we are all as vulnerable as the most vulnerable person in our society. And so unless undocumented immigrants, unless the incarcerated, uh, unless the homeless are brought into the circle of care, with health care universally uh, accessible across the United States, there will always be somebody who, who's going to get sick, who could be the spark that sets off the next epidemic. Greg Gonsalves and Amy Kapczynski, there's so much more to talk about. We will link to your pieces, um, both at Yale, uh, at Yale University. Greg Gonsalves is an epidemiologist at the Yale School of Public Health. Uh, they are co-directors of the Global Health Justice Partnership. When we come back, we look at how more than 100,000 homeless people from New York to Los Angeles to Oakland are at great risk as this pandemic spreads. When political leaders say shelter at home, what about when you don't have a home? Stay with us.